Okay. Check, check. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. So I just, I guess I want to start with uh, the, the question of, of how you came to live without money. How did you come to that choice and how did you come to being able to pull that off? Yeah. Well, actually, it was a, it was like a two-part thing. Because first, um, I, I had been, you know, working full-time and selling lots of drugs full-time and stuff. And I, I decided to live without money. But I hadn't done any of the other work yet. I just, like, I started looking into things and paying attention to the world again and learned about fiat and the fractional reserve and all of this. So I, I just stopped using it. But I was still just hanging out in Oregon and doing all my same stuff. And so it didn't work nearly as well, you know. I was like, I was living with my parents for, or my mom for a while. And it was, but it, the experience was like, it felt good to not be using money really. And then I went back into it a little bit and put, had a job that I could actually support and everything. And, um, you know, I, I realized that if I was gonna use money, Basically, yeah, I, I got into activism after this point. I got a, maybe a year of not using money at all, maybe like six months. Uh, and I, I realized I, I needed money to buy organic food and to be able to put some energy into projects that I was working on. Because I started working with a group in Portland. We called ourselves Evolve PDX. It was like a spin-off from the Million Mask March. We all met there and then started organizing homeless outreach events. And it's like I couldn't do anything but show up, you know, or talk to people. I couldn't, like, get things printed. I couldn't buy food to cook or anything. Mm -hmm. So I went and got a job, but my focus was, like, a job that I could support. You know, that way it felt like the energy wasn't being, you know, I wasn't just doing, like, a trade of my time and energy just for money. Like, at least I was supporting something I wanted and then getting money for it. And that worked for like a year, a little over a year. Um, I, I split my money up in 25% uh, rent. I was living in a communal house. 25% organic food for me and the people there and people at work. I'd bring food into the break room all the time. And 50% for my activism. Um, and then after, yeah, like a year of that, and coming back around, organizing a few events. I organized the Million Mask March the next year, and I spent you know, like $4,000 on it. Um, I got 500 copies of Adam's book when it came out. I burned 500 copies of an Elias Clay CD, another friend's CD, a documentary, got 500 anonymous, or like Guy Fox masks to give away. Like, I went crazy. Yes. <laughs> I, I fed, there was like 700 people that showed up. I fed everybody wow. organic vegan food. And, um, had live music like it was crazy <laughs> but <laughs> then like a month and a half two months after that I came down to the, the first Anarchapulco and some combination of all of the things there meeting people that I had watched on YouTube and getting to know them as people and getting out of the country and out of the I mean I, I really hadn't left the northwest in a decade you know we traveled a lot when I was a kid on vacations, and my family would still go on vacations, but I would never go. Um, so some part of all of that just made me realize that none of that was going to work anymore. Like, I and I, I had already cut back on my time at work. I'd gone to like 30 hours a week instead of 40, or 30, whatever, whatever the handbook said was full time. I was like, well, I'm going to cut down to that. Mm -hmm. And I just really, I realized that having my time to invest wherever I wanted was way more valuable than having money to invest in these things. Mm. I was finding myself with enough money to do all the stuff, but not enough time to fit things in. I would schedule, like I, try, I got a volunteering gig once a week at my co-op, and like two weeks in was just so burnt out from everything that was going on that I had to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was kind of like the end of, you know, the end of the money world for me, and it took a couple mm. months and then, uh, actually, I almost went on the Abraham Hicks cruise in 2015. It was the same week as Rainbow. And I, like, had requested time off of work already. And as it got closer, I just felt like Rainbow was the better choice. And I requested more time off so I could hitchhike back. 
and then my boss is like, well, if you're going to take so much time off and you already cut your hours, why don't you just quit? I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, put in my notice and I gave away everything besides what fit in my backpack mm -hmm. and my books that I boxed up and took to my parents' house and I moved out of my house and I, I left with... I left with like $200. By the time I got to Rainbow, I had maybe 80 left or 60 left after like splitting mm. gas to get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, so what kind of, what kind of currency are you running on? You know, you're not running on fiat. You're not running on crypto. Like what, what kind, you're running on some kind of currency, but mm. what, what is it? Just energy exchange. I mean, all the currencies are just uh, trying to represent our time and energy. And I just directly exchange energy with people. You know, I come to came to Anarchapulco and got you know the Freemans took care of getting me here and my bills once I was down here and stuff, just as an exchange for taking care of food for them and helping with the conference. You know, so going through emails and stuff. And I mean, I just just direct energy exchange is really what I try to do all the time. Um, and you know. I have to deal with money sometimes, just because like airlines don't want any, a meal cooked for them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're missing out. But, <laughs> but even that's most of the time when there's anything that does involve currency, there's someone else who is still playing that money game that will just take care of it for me as their way of like giving back for what I whatever it is that I'm doing for them, or just. You know, someone that knows me and just knows what I'm doing, I'll just, you know, I, I just put it all out there. I just tell everybody, like, hey, here's what I'm doing, here's what's yeah. coming up, here's the things I'm trying to manifest, and somebody will just say, like, oh, you know, I, I did one, I did a crowdfunding, like, a year ago. Mm -hmm. It didn't raise any money, the actual crowdfunding itself, mm -hmm. but I got a free video camera out of it. Mm -hmm. I got a free, you know what I mean? Like, a, a mm -hmm. bunch of stuff came in, all the things that I needed happened mm -hmm. without anyone having to use money, because somebody had a video camera they weren't using, and somebody had a tripod that they weren't using, yeah. and some, all the, you know, somebody bought me the flash drives that I needed, rather than giving me money, which would then have fees removed from it, you know, through... Patreon or whatever, well, whatever the hell I was using, like they're just like, well, show me, the, give me the link on Amazon, and I'll just order them and have them shipped to where you are. Nice. And you know that way, yeah, you can't completely get out of it right now because mm -hmm. of the paradigm, but you definitely don't need to use it very much. And mm -hmm. if I wasn't doing like my full time activism gig, I wouldn't need it at all. You know, mm -hmm. in in a couple of years when I'm on land, like settled. I won't be using any money whatsoever, because mm. or anyone else's, you know, because it's just not necessary when you're growing your own food and capturing your own energy. Mm. Um, I think, as far as you know, like the the not spending right now side of it, a lot of people say like, well, it's, it's their their savings, it's their cushion, it's their for the future, all that stuff. You know, that side of money. Mm -hmm. The only currencies that I see as actually being valuable are yourself, your skills, your abilities, your, your healing, your, you know, your, your investment in yourself, mm -hmm. all the aspects of that, your body, you know, feeding yourself well is investing, like, mm -hmm. and, and your relationships with others, and those two things can't, they can't be stolen from you, their value can't disappear because of a market crash, they can't, you, you can always, they're always there. And they they only get stronger, you know. They spread. You mm -hmm. meet people and build a relationship with them, and then people that they know, who have heard about you, you have a relationship now, even though you don't. You mm -hmm. know, I've, I'm in a. I get to New Hampshire and don't know anybody and need a place to stay for the night. I put a thing out on Facebook, and a bunch of people tag their friends, and they're like, "Hey, you should let Kenny stay with you. He's oh, great." Man. You know, like it. The the flow yeah. extends out. You know, because yeah. everybody you know knows a bunch of people. That's right. Yeah. So uh, that's social currency. Yeah. 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 But it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like I'm, I'm not hung up on that word. I'm, I yeah. think I'm just, I guess like obviously like the reason I even wanted to sit sit with you is because of um, being really impressed by the way that I see you living your life out, living your philosophy out, and I'm also 
like really aware of just that 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 in between place, you know, and it feels really agitating. Yeah. And so that because like I, like when I try to imagine, um, you know, just even like unplugging from my, you know, like my my bank account, like I'm still so plugged in, you know, like even like in, in to the to the U. S. and um, and I want to know, like, practically, tangibly, like, you know, like, how, you know, how would one break free? How would one unplug? So maybe that's why I keep using the word currency is right. just is to acknowledge that there is, that there are, like, you know, two things happening at once. Like you, like you said, there's this new world that you've got, you know, that you're firmly planted in that transcends, you know, the messiness and the limits of, of cash as we know it. And, um, but then also by your own admission, it's you know you it, you can't yet completely unplug like as you you know like because you're still wanting to be engaged in in life to yeah. an extent so until and even like when you get unplugged when you do imagine going completely undone it's like it's at the cost of something it's at the yeah. you know it's at the cost of uh it's just a different chapter for me i mean yeah, if yeah. you look at like certainly for some people you know it would be a huge cost like someone like like Nathan or Juan or who, who their whole life is around this bad side of things being online being connected to the online world program all of those things you have to give up a huge you know a huge portion of your life in order to live off the grid with the land all these things but for me it's just a matter of changing my activism from events mm-hmm. and reaching out to people in that way to I'm I'm getting to the point where I, like, my intention right now, besides the ones that I'm always putting out of just, like, love, guidance, support, my healing, my intention right now is simply to make myself, to be the kind of person that I want to see raising kids to change the world. And so my activism will be going from event-based and visiting community-based to focusing on my own kids and my own community. And so I, I, I don't see this giving anything up at all. It's it's just moving from one facet to another. And I mean, other than that, like everything else is so easy, you know. Like you can we can grow all our own food. We can build our own houses. We can you can have you can have internet if you want it, and you can get it cheap, very very cheap, or free if you know somebody like Ryan. You can set something up like that, or you know, or even like if there's a, a property you know, the next property over, and they have internet, and we can work out a trade, or something, you know, like, there's no reason to really give so, anything up. Okay, so, so, like, would you, are you, would you say that you think money is a false belief? Yeah, I think money, money is, money is predicated on the, the, I, like, the illusion of scarcity. If you don't, if you don't believe that there's not enough of everything to go around, then you don't need paper and digits to keep track of everything to distribute it that way. There's more than enough food on the planet. There's more than enough capability of food, to, of growing food to feed everyone on the planet organic, amazing food all the time. There's no reason for there to ever be numbers attached to it. The only actual limitation would be if somebody wants something that is, you know, has to be grown very far away. And even that's a false limitation because we have greenhouses and we have hydroponics and we have aquaponics. You can grow any food anywhere in the world all year round. You know, and that's, it's like that with most of these things. The numbers are just there because it, it creates the illusion of scarcity. It's very, oh, it costs a lot of money. That means that it's limited. Not so many people can get it. But most of the stuff, I mean, most of the things that people spend money on don't matter anyway. It's completely okay. <laughs> useless oh, things. But yeah. But you, okay, so it's not, okay, so I realize, like, that my, uh, my reservation, it's not so much about the material resource for the reason that you're talking about. Because, like, I, I do see and sense like the you know the plentifulness that Gaia gives so it's not so it's not the material resource it's like the access like you you know like you said like to buy like if you want to if you if you were to want to travel um and and so like for those sort of certain I guess like certain maybe more experiences or or I don't know the word privileges you know abilities like the ability to be able to do something and where um, money seems to be a barrier to entry. Yeah, I mean, it can be just because of the way it's set up right now, right? Like, there's a lot of government and corporate 
lockdowns to make it so, like, there you have to pay in order to fly or pay in order to get on a train, even if that train's about to leave and it's half empty. Things like that that don't make any... It's artificial scarcity. Mm-hmm. They're, they're creating an artificial scarcity around transportation. There's planes flying around that are mostly empty. There's trains driving around that are mostly empty. Never mind people's private cars and stuff, but, like, just things that are there for public transportation that are wasted space because they want to make it seem as though it has to cost money. And, I mean, you can get anywhere for free, too. You know, you're not necessarily as fast, but sometimes just as fast. You can go, you can start hitchhiking and get a ride all the way to where you're going because there's someone coming by that's going right where you're going. You know, <laughs> you can ride bikes. There's plenty of people, especially out here along the coast, all the way from B.C. all the way down to Panama. There's yeah. people that ride their bikes that whole trip. You know, and just stop and visit um, missions and communities and stuff and get food. And, like, they'd spend zero dollars going, you know, 4,000, 5,000 miles. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can get, like, across the ocean is the only time that it would be somewhat difficult. And even then, there's lots of boats where you can go volunteer. You know, I know lots of people that get to Hawaii by doing that. Mm. They just volunteer on a ship when they drop food and everything's covered and they drop you off and they give you, like, a thousand bucks. You can't experience anything that you aren't creating for yourself, right? Like, people who worry about their safety worry about these things all the time. Like, they're the ones who experience the most difficulty around these things. Like, it's... You... I I, don't know, I live my, my life based on an understanding of the laws of the universe as I know them, and that is that, you know, that which is like unto itself is drawn. And so, if you live in fear, you're going to experience the things that you fear. If you live in the idea of scarcity, if you're always worried about not having enough or thinking that you don't have enough, thinking you have to work hard to have enough, that's what you're going to experience. When you live life, and I'm, I, this is not, I mean, I've read and heard these things, and this is like, it's, you test it, and it proves true, and you continue testing it, and it just gets more and more true as you practice it more. Like, I just trust that everything's going to be taken care of, and it always is. And, you know, it's not like, oh, I want a $30 million yacht with, you know, cocaine and strippers. Like, when you're doing things that are in alignment with the universe and with the good of everyone and everything, you've got a lot of leverage because that's what, that's what we're here for. We're here to serve each other and the earth. We're here to make everything better for everyone around us. And so when that's what your goal is, everything else just falls into place. And the only thing that stops it is doubt. When you say, you know, when someone says, like, okay, I want to I wanna go on this trip, but it's going to cost too much money, and I don't know if I'm going to this, and that. Well, you just, you, you, you were feeling good. You were making it happen by saying, I'm going to go on it and thinking about it. And as soon as you start putting up those barriers, you move yourself farther and farther away from that thing, making it more difficult for it to happen. You know, and it's where visualization and affirmations and things come into play is, like, you you can't get it until you already feel as though you have it. You know, if you're in the, the mode of searching for something, in the mode of trying to get to it, you're keeping it away from you because you are in the feeling of not having it. You know, like with this cruise, like, I have, you know, a couple hundred pesos, <laughs> and, like, that's it. And, but I know, I just know, and as soon as I decided to go on it, you know, when I was making my list, it's like, I'm going on this cruise. It's going to happen. The money's going to show up, however it does. And I just know that. And it always works. Like, <laughs> I've never had anything, any time that, that something hasn't played out the way that I want it to is because I wasn't, I wasn't behaving in the way that could allow it to play out. I was holding myself away from it. I was, you know, doubting myself the whole time, or I was, just, you know, saying, I want it, but, I want it, but, and that, that doesn't allow it to happen. You know, I, I found, I mean, so many things. I, I think I might have told you with Elias, right? Like, I heard her music years ago, like 2012, 2013. Going into November of 2014, I reached out to her and was like, hey, I want to give away 500 copies of your CD. Uh, I'm going to burn them myself and burn Lightscribe labels onto them with your website and stuff uh, and give them away this March. Is that cool? 
of course. Yes. <laughs> like, I, I've actually given away more copies of her CD than she has because she pays to get real ones printed. Um, <laughs> and so that was November of 2014. And then 2015 in Arcapulco shifted everything for me. Just like that experience of being totally different. And while I was there, so much, um, so many conversations, that's where I really started having like powerful conversations where people were asking the questions that let this stuff come through me. Because I'd been studying the law of attraction for like, a f it was literally like a year, it was like February 2014 to 2015. Mm -hmm. And I just changed every single facet of my life in that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so Anarchapogo shifted it all. And then I went to Rainbow. I left in June. And, like, one of the first couple days, I was wearing my Anarchapulco shirt, peace plus love plus anarchy equals happiness. <laughs> and I started talking to this guy, Pitstop, who was an anarchist from Denver. And we had this great conversation the first time. And we didn't really, like, talk to each other too much over the rest of the time but he was always hanging out around my kitchen and he would just like give me looks every now and then and I would come over and jump into a conversation with other people he was having to like support it from the other side because he's very like logical you know that that physical reductionist viewpoint and so I would come in with the other side and balance the conversation out but so that very first conversation we had I was like well if you're in Denver you must know Elias Clay's work right oh yeah she's a friend of mine we go to we are change meetings together and stuff I was like well, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> and so I, I stayed in Wyoming for a few weeks with a bunch, and there was like 10 of us on a, in a van that went and stayed at a friend's house. And then I went to Denver, and within like two days of getting to his house, there was a party at Liberty Lodge, which is like the headquarters of We Are Change, basically. We Are Change, Colorado. And I met Elias that night. Oh, again, I was wearing my Anarchapulco shirt. <laughs> I also met my one of my best friends now, uh, Bruce Bauman. He's like the face of We Are Change Colorado, who named Anarchapulco. Oh, Jeff put a thing on Facebook that was like, sweet. I'm going to throw a freedom conference in Acapulco, half a Bitcoin to whoever comes up with a name. Oh, Bruce sweet. named it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was at his house. Okay. He, thought, he thought he had known me for years. Oh. Like, he came up and just started talking like we knew each other, and he's like... <laughs> I don't know you, do I? It's like, no, I just got to Denver yesterday. Like, um, and then I met Elias and, like, totally geeked out. You know, like, five minutes, like, oh, my God. Blah, blah, blah. And then, like, awkward silence. And then she, she started talking about the shirt. She's like, oh, did I already miss it? And I was like, yeah, you missed this year's, but it's going to happen again next year. Uh, and she, you know, she said that she was interested in coming. She, you know, thought it would be really cool. And I was like, do you want to perform? Yeah. I will make that happen. Oh my gosh! I didn't. I, I didn't speak to Jeff once the entire first year. Uh, I didn't meet Nathan, and he wasn't involved yet. Like I literally knew no one on the organizing side of it. Yeah. But I just decided I'm going to make it so that you perform at the conference. <laughs> seven days or seven months to the day later, I picked her up at the airport oh, in Acapulco oh, yeah. and got her over to the wow. concert. Wow. Like. The ticket was paid for with someone else's airline miles. They took care of it for me. Uh, she stayed at the apartment that I got for a group of us where I got money loaned to me to get the apartment and then everyone else pitched in and paid for the whole apartment. Yeah. And, you know, like, it all just Worked perfectly out. lines up. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, like, before you made that declaration, like, did you feel something like something about it seemed inspired you know what I mean like, I mean that's it how always did you, in that split moment just you know see it and de and, de and declare it so well that's that, I mean it's all like there's very little I do that isn't like inspired mm. action that's that's what the whole game is is you you lay out your intentions and you you know where you're going you know not like an end goal in, in a physical sense in any way, but an end goal in like what the feeling is going to be, what the, what the state is, the process that you're going through. And when you hold yourself in that way, the inspired, like the ins inspiration is always popping up and you just follow that. And that's where a lot of people get off track and a lot of, I, 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 I work as a middleman in a lot of conversations where one person's talking about these ideas of like the law of attraction and manifestation and someone else generally with a very like scientific outlook is like well that's just bullshit it makes people not do anything and it's like well no it's, you need both sides you do the visualization you 
be sure you hold yourself in a space as though it's already a thing. And then, as you're doing that, the perfect opportunities will arise. And you do have to physically take those, too. You can't just keep visualizing and have somebody say, hey, I've got an opportunity for you. You're like, no, no, I'm visualizing. Hey, do you want to come do this thing for free? No, I'm visualizing. Like, <laughs> it takes both sides. But yes. if you try to do either one without the other, you're not going to get anywhere. If you try to just visualize things and you don't ever follow inspiration, you're going to miss all your chances. If you try to just go and make it happen without being in the right in, in alignment with that end goal, you're going to fall you might get there eventually, but you're going to take a much more difficult path. It's the finding that balance between the the energetic work, the emotional, psychological work and being fully present in your life so that you can follow these perfect little opportunities that pop up everywhere. I, I, for me like I don't know. I have a lot of a lot of little phrases that I like to say, but like my, it's all it's just trust falling the universe, like, and that's why for me it's a big thing for me to leave somewhere with no plans and no money, except for you know in a month I'll be there for that event, because then there's no preconceptions, there's no expectations, that's what I mean. there's no okay, attachment. Like how in the world do you? <laughs> do that like that isn't that's not maddening i just no it's I mean, maddening to, to try to have place plans with no about money things. and no wait you said no money and no plans yeah just like then, you know it's like so the next time this is happening because i've got a little bit of plans going on right now uh april 7th to 9th i'll be at free your mind conference in philadelphia may 5th through 8th i'll be doing cooking exhibitions at the evolve expo in denver so you, so you, you have known life in the matrix. Like you do know what that is like. Not or to the extent you? that a lot of people did. Yeah, because I never. <sighs> I mean, I I played the game, mm -hmm. but it was all. It was. I made a decision to play the game, and never actually. I, I never believed in. The, I've never voted. I never paid taxes, but like I went and got the job, and I got married, and I went to college, and suffered through alcoholism and depression that entire time because I was living living life as a character other than myself mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely, I spent time in the matrix but it was more like like I was unplugged oh. and then I like plugged myself back you know, I know it's not real steak but I still want, just want to eat it yes. you know, like it, I was I was cipher, so like I yeah. was trying to just take the easy route I, did, I didn't want to deal with all of it um and it sucked. Like, every, every single second of it sucked. So, yeah, there's just something that just sounds and feels so uh, free-falling about it. And then it's really inspiring to see, like, your, your absolute certainty on being caught, you know, like, in a feather bed. Seeing <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, that's, yeah. that's just how life is. Like, it all works out perfectly. And then you die at some point. And... <laughs> whatever like you know uh, people people see it as like a, the biggest thing that holds people back is what they refer to as fear of the unknown in truth everything is unknown and everything is known like it's always going to be exactly what is the next logical step based on your vibration right now always it's known the next thing that's coming maybe not the physical manifestation of it but what you're feeling right now is deciding what your next experience in life is. That's known. Other than that, everything is unknown. There's, you know, even a person with a nine to five job and a wife and kids and every minute of their life scheduled out, everything is unknown. There's no way to know what's gonna happen when you're in the car, when you're walking to the car, when you're in a store, when you're, while you're sleeping, like, everything's unknown. There's only this illusion of knownness that gives people a false sense of security. But it's not even secure. Like, it, it doesn't feel good. The, that, it doesn't feel good to know what's coming next in that sense of, like, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to do this and then that and then this and then that. Like, it might feel comfortable for some people, but it doesn't, it isn't exciting. It isn't joyful. And that's what life is. Life is excitement and joy. And that's why when you're not in those states, you tend to have to self-medicate because... It doesn't feel good to not be living the way that we're designed to live. That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, in your face. Oh, wow. Huh. 
That one's come up a lot down here, this trip. That Which fear, one? fear of the unknown. Really? That people saying it that way. I'm like, everything is unknown. Yeah. Like, there's no... If you're going to fear the unknown... like, And then actually, talking with Sasha, I had a really good point about... Because I, I, was, I was using fear in a much more broad sense. But he brought it to a definition that a lot of people use. Uh, where there's a difference between danger and fear. Right, and I was kind of using them interchangeably in a lot of ways. Like danger is like, you know, there's a car coming at you that's not slowing down. There's a person pulling a gun out in the store that you're in. There's, you know, whatever these things, there are things that are legitimate. There's something negative could happen to you and you can see it happening. And those things are there to trigger a response from you, to change in some way, whether it's you know, the government is coming into your town to do this thing, so you prepare for it. Or instant, instantaneous, you know, someone, this person's pulling out a gun, so you either run away, die behind something, knock it out of their hand, whatever. Like, danger is a natural thing, and it, it causes us to have a, a reaction in order to protect ourselves. Fear is a completely illogical, non-real thing that only exists in your imagination. Fear is like, oh, I might die without having money. Oh, I might, I might get robbed. Oh, I, unless there's someone coming at you that looks like they're robbing you, th there's no reason to have a fear of being robbed. You know, the the fears that people have are all only in their own head, which then they manifest because they've been putting so much energy into it. Mm. If you every time that you think about going down a dark alley, you think you're going to get robbed, and then you find yourself going down a dark alley it's probably a pretty good chance you're going to get robbed now because you've visualized it. You've felt the energy of it. You've literally experienced it in your head. You've prepared it for yourself. You wrote the story and now you're reading it. I've never been afraid of anything. One thing, I pretty much wanted to die for most of my life, so the idea of death being scary doesn't make any sense to me. One, it's a guarantee. It's the only guarantee. You're going to die and you have no control over when it happens. Why the hell would you be afraid of that? <laughs> and two, I don't feel that way anymore, but for a long time it was like, well, death would be better than this. So there's like, there's never been any fear around that. And then around anything else, you know, robbed, any of that stuff. One, probably the baddest motherfucker on the street. I'm not worried about it. Like, unless you have a gun and you are planning to shoot me with it, you're not going to do anything to me. You're going to end up in a hospital. <laughs> and two, nowadays, like, what, are you going to steal my tent? Are you going to steal my shoes? You want, you want my toothbrush? Like, I have a cell phone, I guess. That's the only... And I don't care. It's not my cell phone. It's given to me so that other people can contact me. Like, I, I had a track phone for the first 10, year, or 10 months I was traveling because just in case I needed to make calls. And then other people were like, it'd be cool to be able to get a hold of you all the time. Yeah. And so I got a free phone and then someone else pays for a plan for it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, so there's... Yeah, the because I have no fear around any of these things, I never have a negative experience around these things. Mm -hmm. I was walking through Houston in November of last year. I, I went to the Ford of the Community Festival that Derek throws every six months or so, and I got done. The you know, I don't do loud music indoors. I don't do drunk people, any of that stuff. And so, the festival started. It was like an all day thing, and once it got to like nine nine thirty ish. It was like, I'm going to head back to the house, which was, you know, we were like on one edge of downtown Houston, and his house was, you know, seven and a half miles away over in, across between the ghetto and the burbs. Like, it was, you know, definitely crack houses around, but it was all houses. I don't know what that means. <laughs> and so I just started walking. And, you know, I also had never been to the city before. Like, I'd been there for one day, literally. Mm -hmm. And I, this random tweaker came up to me along the way and asked if I had some water. So I gave him my water bottle and was mm -hmm. like walking with me, talking crazy for a while. And I was just like, yeah, cool. And just like, you know, that, okay. And then we got to where there was a train going by and I had to stop for a while. And he took off his shirt and was out in the street yelling and like waving his arms around and stuff. And the train got done and I just kept walking and he walked off in a different direction. <laughs> and I could see when that happened, like... I could see, for one thing, how so many other people would react to it and where that would go. Like, that is the, exactly the sort of situation that leads to someone being stabbed by a tweaker on the street. Because they're like, oh, do I have some water? And they 
act fearful, they clench up, they say no, they maybe they're rude. Like, there's so many ways that that could turn into a really bad thing if that's the sort of situations you're creating for yourself. Coming into 2015, I decided it was time to like allow money, at least in my reality, because I had been actively like pushing it out for the first 10 months or so of my travels. Like, people would offer me money at the end of events, and I would say no. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was, that it was creating resistance, because mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not, I'm not putting up a block to that money, I'm putting up a block to people giving energy back to me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I opened that up, and as soon as I did that, I got paid like $400 to cook a Christmas meal for a family. Wow. And like, literally like the day after I had a conversation with one of my like spiritual advisor type friends, yeah. uh, that happened. It was like right away um, and then came down here and I was cooking a lot of food and giving it to people and just letting them pay what they wanted to pay and it was the flow started coming in really good I got a I got paid for a couple of festivals last year um, which was cool it's like I would do the same thing that I was gonna do for free and then they would either offer me at the beginning or at the end like well we'll pay you this for it yeah. okay so sure nice. I'm gonna do it anyway it's like <laughs> um, and then that at the end of the year there, like October, November, I like, you know, I was over here, no money whatsoever. And I was coming back and then I like crossed over the balance point. And that's where I was like, oh, I'll create a crowdfunding campaign to raise the money to do these things. And it, you know, budgeted in some stuff that was like just for the work. And then some stuff that was like, you know, and airfare costs and stuff. So I don't have to hitchhike for these places and things. And then I went to, before the community festival, I don't think I would have gone all the way out there except my plan was to go and make this fudge and make these flatbreads and hummus and make money off of it and stuff. And so because I was doing these things with the intention of making money, I lost shitloads of money mm. and didn't have nearly as good a time with it as I would have if I was just going the way that I had been before. And so, you know, coming back full circle at the end of 2015, I, like, found where the tipping point was and was able to step back from that and not, not go down that path of actually pursuing money. Just, I, I found a really good balance now of doing my thing, but allowing everything to come in fully as it will, however it will. You know, you know I, I, I won't do anything for money that I wouldn't do for free, and I won't do anything just for money. Yeah, it's very similar, but it's like, you know, the intention is never to get money. Mm. And I won't do anything for, like, I don't care how much, there was a conversation here at the house the other day about that. Oh, you do a lot for a thousand Bitcoin. I'm like, nothing that I wouldn't do for zero Bitcoin. I'm not a whore. Mm. Like, I have principles, I have values, I have intentions, and those don't change based on numbers. Mm -hmm. And that, I feel like, is really important, because otherwise... That if, if that stuff's flexible, then you're not being honest with yourself. It doesn't matter if you're being honest with other people. You're not being honest with yourself if, you're, if your principles can change, if your values can change based on numbers or anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be just money, like a car or gold or, you know, any physical things, self-betterment, things like that. I, I had been, like, you know, just totally gone uh, until the end of... 2012 basically like December of 2011 I took a bunch of mushrooms that broke down my old world pretty much I realized that I I didn't exist there was no Kenny there was just like a faceless thing and a bunch of masks I would step into based on the situation and so that's part of why I had just numbed myself the entire time and so 2012 then was like crazy tumultuous as you know the old was shattered and there was no new yet mm. and so it was a lot of psychedelics one really fucking crazy I, I dated a stripper for like six months we lived together and like just fucking silliness <laughs> lots of selling drugs lots of just crazy shit and then in December of 2012 like I, I kind of started getting back on track I got a job in like September at a, a real pretty cool company that's where I actually discovered kombucha. We were the main distributor for GT's Kombucha. Oh, sweet. Uh, in Oregon. Yeah. And um, 
I got my medical card, so I started hanging out in dispensary, started hanging out with people with a totally different vibe than I had been. Mm. And then in December, uh, this woman who worked there, that we would talk about kombucha off and on when it was like one of our, you know, things in common. And I gave her my business card with like all the brands that we carried on the back of it. It's like, you know, I can get you wholesale costs on stuff. And then I was like sitting there, you know, they give you a sample every day when you came in. Oopsie. Which was great because that's the place, it was right up the road from me when I quit that job and started living without money. I would just walk in every single day and they would give me a nug. And then other people would smoke me out. Like, but, uh, so I gave her my business card and then like 10 minutes later she walked over and gave me her phone number. And I was like, oh, well that's cool. That's not what I was shooting for at all. Like, I've never actually gotten someone's phone number before. I've always just like connected with people that I already knew. Uh, so that was a cool experience. But, so we spent the next like three days um, we each of us would like work off and on here and there but like when we weren't at work we were just like talking constantly we'd talk until like four in the morning and just pass out mm-hmm. and she she really started changing a lot of things for me talk, she was asking me questions about my childhood things that I had never looked at at all I mean, just lots of things and pointing out things as as um coping mechanisms rather than problems you know it's like well you did that because of this trauma that you told me about it's like oh okay and uh you know she introduced me to like what gmos are she saw auras like that's how she saw people was their energy Mm -hmm. and that was like my first kind of being open to talking about those kind of things so i was like a hardcore atheist for a long time Mm -hmm. um and so and so we actually we were together for like four days like constantly and then we actually had sex for the first time on December 21st 2012 and then everything you know shifted from there obviously for everyone like you know, I don't I haven't met anyone in the last two years that didn't have their life change in December of that year um, and then going into 2013 I like started my own business making cannabis infused barbecue sauce and honey and things like that and uh quit my job and like wasn't selling drugs and was just making money doing my own thing healing people and making medicine food and that's when I first started cooking for people like large scale there's a an expo that would happen once a month at this dispensary and the owners of the dispensary liked my food so like I made like a pot of pulled pork with my barbecue sauce and they liked it so much they hired me to or not hired but like they asked me to come cater um, twice a week they had, like, live music one night and live stand-up another night. So I did that for a few months, and that's when I first started, like, cooking for people and, like, just loved it. Yeah. And then as that kind of dwindled because their numbers got really small in the summer and it was costing me more to put together food than I could make selling plates to people. Uh, and I had quit my job, so now, like, my money was completely gone at this point. And so I went back to, like, living with my mom. And I... Uh, I watched Zeitgeist, and that, I, friends had talked about it for years, you know, most of them, like, watched it and got all excited for a minute and then forgot about all that stuff again. Like, I watched it and was like, motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> and started watching and reading and listening to all sorts of stuff. I was, uh, I would, like, play games on the computer and just listen to Stephen Molyneux the whole time. I would do research while I was listening to different things, like just constant input, whether I was distracting myself with a game or something, or if I was researching, I also had the audio going, and and so, like, 2013, the first half was, like, usually, yeah, the first quarter was, like, starting my own business, changing all of that stuff, and then the next quarter was, like, getting away from that, starting to research and things like that, and changing my diet, that's when I started going to an organic diet, and that... I became vegan very quickly. I guess it was, yeah, that was like the second quarter. I went like all organic, cut out all the processed stuff, cut out all the crap, no more alcohol, no more drugs of any kind. And then the third quarter, I was like really researching stuff. I started a couple Facebook pages that got a few thousand likes like right away and started like pushing all that stuff and then went to the Million Mask March and met that was my very first protest and my last protest because I was came out of that with if we're going to go out and just hold signs and try to get people's attention 
we're wasting our time. If nobody sees us, then we're just, you know, standing around drinking off together, like, and we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do any, like, we need to go out and make a positive change, do something to actually change the world, and then if people see it, it's a bonus. And so a group of us came together that had been at that event and started doing these homeless outreach events. In our very first meeting, that message came to, through me, like, really clearly, and I had to say that, and we were all like, yeah, let's make all of our events about feeding people and treating them like humans, not just going out and like, here's food, here's food, but, like, we would hang out all day in a park and talk to these people and listen to music, and it was like a, a community picnic kind of thing. Uh, and as soon as I got that, like, solutions-oriented mindset, it was like two months from that until some friends introduced me to the Law of Attraction on a VHS tape. And they explained <laughs> Abraham Hicks and what Esther's doing, and I was like, mm, doesn't sound... Skeptical. Yeah, I was like, that sounds uh, interesting, but I trust you guys. Let's watch it. And at the end, I, I told him, I was like, I, I don't know if she's channeling. Uh, she's a really good actress if she's not, that's for sure doesn't really matter because the message resonates like that made sense and so yeah that was February of 2014 and from there I I listened to their stuff read their books listened to and watched uh, Ralph Smart Alan Watts did affirmation like flashcards and like on my doors and went to started going to different like workshops around town and stuff and like just focused I had already spent most of a year cleaning my body, which was necessary to get my brain to a point where I was even open to these things. You know, to a clogged body, you know, like, your body full of crap, your brain can't even function at a level to understand these things. You can't remember. And I, so I spent, like, the entire next year, within, like, a month and a half of that, that discovery, I got my job at Bob's Red Mill. Uh, all non-GMO company, employee-owned, like, great people, great people. I was in the kitchen. Uh, I started as a server and was an expo, or the expo, like a month and a half later. And, I mean, we would have all day long conversations that would just ripple around the, the kitchen about chemtrails, 9-11. Like, there was no one there that wasn't asking the questions, at least. Yeah. It was amazing. Wow. Uh, and I was making, by the time I left, I was making sixteen fifty plus tips, plus profit sharing. As the expo in a restaurant. Wow. Like, <laughs> and I got a 25% discount on Bob's Red Mill price. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I just Very practiced cool. all of that nonstop until, yeah, until I started traveling. And that's the, that was the thing is like, coming back from Anarchapulco, being there, being, that's what it was, is like new people and a new place. I was able to actually fully embody the new version of myself. I had made all these changes, I had done all this reprogramming, I had made all these changes in myself, but I was still in the same place. I was still around the same people, the same energy. I was still, I was still not able to fully embody that because everyone else had their perceptions of me that didn't match, but you're going to live up to their perceptions too. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's how I just like knew that I needed to leave. I needed to start over. At least for a time. I wasn't sure if I was going to be gone forever or whatever, but I knew that I had to leave in order to let all of that manifest. Yes. You know, let the new me manifest. You, you know where you are, and you know where you want to be. You don't need to know the in-between. Just know that you're already here. By wanting it and knowing what it is, you're already there, and hold that vibration, and the in-between happens. That's... That's the thing, like, oh you, know, God, you don't have to fun. know how to get to there, you know what I mean? You know that you've already been making steps, too. Celebrate those steps. Remind yourself how important those steps were and how, at any point before those, those steps probably would have looked impossible and how easy they actually were in the big scheme of things and how the rest of these steps are going to be even easier because you're more practiced at it now. You know? I'd, yeah. For, like, I guess, really, how do I do all of it is hard ass work reprogramming my brain flashcards every day a couple times a day like writing down the affirmations like in, I have a book of affirmations that I keep for myself I don't do flashcards so much anymore they get mangled in traveling but 
when I was at home, when I, when I had a house and was, you know, doing a job and all that stuff, like, it was a couple times a day. I had a little deck, and I would add new ones to it as I thought of things that I needed to add in there, and I would just go through them and read them all, shuffle them up and read them all, and just say them out loud to myself. It takes a hundred repetitions of something for it to go from, like, there's, like, different levels of memory, different levels of, of, of program running. You know, when you say something once or hear it once or think it once, it's just kind of there, and it goes away. After a hundred times, it's like it moves Ooh, to the next level, okay. and that's when you start to get like physical manifestations of it. And, stuff. Oh. and so, you know, just those affirmations of like, I am always financially secure, even when I, or, I am always financially secure. I am abundance. Abundance is always there for me. These, you know, these things, and just practice them yeah. until those programs knock out the old programs and then everything else the the outside world responds to this you can't change any of that until you change this and then that stuff basically just changes itself you just have to go along with the ride and not resist the flow yes 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 okay how many like successful examples do you run into of like successful manifestors like yourself a lot yeah yeah is it your norm? Like yeah. you're like the company you keep or like yeah, living the, this way. The people that I I mean you can only you only interact with people that are within a certain range of yourself. You know what I mean? Like at least in any meaningful way. Like I'll run into a random tweaker on the street, but it's like very momentary kinda of, like anyone that's not within whatever range of where I am is anything outside of that is only going to be like a passing thing and so everyone basically everyone that I interact with is either doing the work they're they're it you know they're either where I am they're doing it as well as I do they're doing it better than I do or they're looking for support to get better at it but they're already on the path of it and then there's like a few people that I interact with who are in that stage of like they kind of know it, but they, they don't believe it yet because they're coming from that, like, atheist scientific mindset mm-hmm. where, like, I, I don't, I just can't believe it until I see it. It's like, well, then you're never going to see it, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, but, but even those people, it's like, they, they know it, they just, there's something, there's just, like, one little thing holding them back, and usually yeah. just hearing my, my experiences yeah. push them over the edge because yeah. that is first-hand knowledge of it like they they can see it with me they can see like i entered the country with ten dollars <laughs> gave all of it to the taxi driver to get to the airport look I, at my I, house i know like, <laughs> i mean and i was i, I couldn't believe it. like and you and you walked right didn't you walk from the airport or something yeah yeah i walked all the way from the airport to the yes, I mean, with this big ass backpack and every, i mean because and i didn't know where i was going they gave me an address that Jeez. Google Maps said didn't exist. I actually turned down this street, cause, or no, the next street, because it said Alfredo, it said something with the number, didn't exist, it said Alfredo V. Bonefield, uh-huh. which is the neighborhood. I didn't know that. It's also the name of the next street. <laughs> so I got rid of the first part, and I was like, well, Alfredo V. Bonefield, it must be right over here. I turned down that wrong street, made it like 10 steps, and Jen found my phone number in her notes from last year and called me. Oh, uh-huh. my and had Ryan, he had Ryan come out, and then we ended up, you know, walking back to the main street, and he's like, uh, do you see the Pemex? And, you know, figured yes. it out. But, wow. like, literally, as soon as I took the wrong path, yeah. it solved itself. Wow. Like, <laughs> yeah. awesome. And that's, I mean, that, that's, that's typical. Yeah. <laughs> when it's that willingness, too. Like, mm. don't wait around for the way, just go. Like, oh, I could try to figure out how to get there, see if I can get a taxi, see, well, you know. I had sent them a message earlier in the day saying I didn't have any money. Could I borrow money for a taxi once I got here? Mm-hmm. And then my data didn't work when I got here, so I had no way of checking to see if they got the message, so I wasn't going to just assume. Yeah. So rather than putting anything on anyone other than myself, I just walked. Wow. And that's, yeah, just go. It's trust fall. You know, just trust fall the universe and it'll get taken care of. <laughs> oh, God, Kenny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny's Conscious Kitchen. Uh-huh. Yeah? Does that does that name still resonate or what would you, what would, what would it be? I, mean, I don't know. I don't... 
I still have the website. Yeah, Yeah. Kenny's Conscious Kitchen was originally a it was a show that I was going to start. I had the first few episodes like raw footage Mm -hmm. recorded Mm -hmm. from like three years ago, and I just never got around to editing it because I hate video editing. (laughs) Um, And then talking with my friend uh, Andy Harrison, who's a musician and a workshop presenter, and I went to a bunch of his workshops in Portland. He came and played at the uh, protest that I put on, or not put but the, what had been a protest that I turned into a celebration in March. Um, he came and played his music at the end of that, because he does workshops, and his workshops are like, talk about an idea, play a song that integrates it. Talk about an idea, play a song that integrates it. And all of his music is about these things. Nice. And just really good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so last, last winter, right before, the day before I got the uh, cooking for the family and stuff, I he had reached out to me and said, um, you know, anytime you need anything, let me know. If you want to do, like, counseling, I do all this different, like, brand management, all these different things, just let me know and, you know, no charge. Mm-hmm. So we had, like, a four-hour phone call. Wow. And uh, he went through his, like, 11-step brand thing and the questions and the feelings you want to evoke and what the actual things are that you're creating and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and like Kenny's Conscious Kitchen came out of that nice okay Um, or at least the name like came back around Mm -hmm. because I had already named the the show that that never happened yeah Um, but then it's like I mean you say that it it was the name of a show but it it actually became like much more than a show you know (laughs) It, it became like this sort of build what are those like when they just like spontaneously like pop up like yeah. pop up kitchens like for, yeah. you know like all over the world <laughs> yeah yeah and it's Which kind of better like, than a show I have a logo that I'll like slap on the table when I'm catering events sometimes nice. but I don't really use it much mm-hmm. I mean, I built the website last year before the conference okay and I just spent a bunch of time building the website and writing up artic- like not articles but like all the pages and yes. designing all the stuff and then I wrote a few, I, I didn't write, like, at all from that point until I found Steam in July. Okay. And then wrote a ton and stuff, but I haven't, I haven't put, like, any yeah. of it on the website. It's sure. still pretty barren at this point. I have no... Well, because your offline life is so rich, you yeah. know? Yeah, and I just don't really, yeah. I don't know, I don't see the need for something other than myself. Yeah. Like, I don't need a, a, a business proxy. or a, yeah, I don't need a front, like, it's just Kenny. Yeah. Me. Like, Kenny's Conscious Kitchen was always just whatever kitchen I was in. Right. You know, there was never a food cart or a restaurant or a yeah. show. Like, it was just me yeah. cooking food. Yeah. Okay, and, like, did you, do you feel like you had that knowing when you, when you talked about that pulled pork and you were making the barbecue sauce, the cannabis-infused barbecue sauce? Yeah. And, and, like, and I, and I saw you light up when you, did, when you described, like, finding pleasure in cooking for people. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Oh, yeah. That was... I mean, I always, I, I cooked a, a lot. Oh, I, I fed too? myself all the time. As okay. Kid, like, as a kid and stuff. Like, okay. I, I, yeah, I was on my own after school by the time I was, you know, like, six or seven, okay. like, every day. Um, and uh, so I cooked a good bit, and then I, I, uh, I, I dated one girl who had, like, a bunch of allergies, and so it, like, it was really fun to, like, cook uh, food around that. Uh-huh. And then... You give you these challenging parameters. Yeah. yeah. Like, we, okay. And then the same with, um, with Erin, the woman who, who introduced me to GMOs and all that stuff, like, at the end of 2012. She had two kids, and all three of them, you know, like, one of the kids couldn't eat soy, one couldn't eat gluten, she couldn't eat either, none of them did dairy, and so it was, like... Yeah. Challenging, interesting yes. to start to work with those things. Uh-huh. But yeah, the first time um, it was actually the so did I did the expo and had the pulled pork and I actually had beef jerky too, which I'd also made in a crock pot. But mm-hmm. I just left the lid ajar so all the moisture evaporated, so it was like soft oh, beef wow. jerky. Uh, the next week, or the end of the, that was Sunday. That Friday it was my first catering gig for them. <laughs> and it was a, uh, there was a tour, a comedy tour documentary thing called the Weediculous Tour that was going to dispensaries all across the country. And I catered for that, and 
there was like 60 people there and I fed all of them. Oh my gosh. And then actually that was the very first interview I ever did of any kind as well. Was they interviewed me in the kitchen. Um, their documentary never ended up coming out. Uh, but yeah, that, when that happened, that was like cooking for people. Big deals, yeah. yeah. definitely cooking for people. Because <laughs> yes. it was so easy. Like, I've never used recipes. I've yeah. never, if I look at any recipes, it's just to see like, People keep talking about this thing. They want me to make, you know, a, a risotto. I don't know what the hell that is. Let's see. Okay, look at the first, you know, like my barbecue sauce. Mm-hmm. I went through like 100 recipes for barbecue sauce, all different styles, mm-hmm. and I had a list of like, here's the things that are in all of them, and here's the things that random people use that sound good. And I got all of those ingredients, and then I just made it up as I went and like wrote down, you know, plus half a teaspoon. Plus a quarter cup of that, and just mm-hmm. built it as I went. <laughs> so it's, I mean, but it, even that was like, I don't even do that anymore. I, I've had a couple people I, I spent time with who were really awesome to have around because they would like follow all of that. They like and document so, it. What did you just What did you just add? Uh-huh. Okay. What did you just add there? Okay. <laughs> you know, because otherwise I just make it all you up You have the no end. record, All yeah. the recipes that are online, like, I just make that it's shit It's a very up. dynamic thing. It's all the correct ingredients, because I remember all the ingredients I put in, <laughs> right. but I'm like, how much was that? <laughs> Tablespoon? <laughs> Tablespoon? Yes, to taste. A quarter cup? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Splash. It's <laughs> this much, whatever that is. Like, it was three seconds of pouring. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, because it's cause my brain's not involved in the process. Like that's my yes. artistic expression. I just walk in the kitchen, and I turn off my brain, and I play paintbrush really well. Wow. And it's just like when I have conversations with people, like Nathan and Jason, the Ribbles, the the tall kids. Like yes, I love over, them. We had like I a six them. hour conversation. Wow. And they came back the next night too, and yeah. hung out, and like those, and like what we have, like the people who are want to ask these questions, yeah. like. With us, it was more of our earlier conversations because a lot of this has been more like my actual, my personal journey. Yeah. But just the concept, like how this stuff flows through, like yeah. that's just me getting out of the way. Like yeah. words are like, say me, say me, say me. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And then people are like, wow, how'd you come up with that? That's exactly what I needed to hear. I'm like, I didn't do shit. <laughs> like, I'm just really good at being open mm-hmm. and letting it come through. I. I don't think the human brain comes up with much of anything. It's mm. for memory, it's for problem solving, it's not for new ideas. Like, it receives ideas, it receives... We're all channeling all the time. Mm. It's just a matter of how open your channel is, how aware you are of it, mm-hmm. and, you know, whether or not you're trying to take credit for it. Mm-hmm. If you try to take credit for it, oh, it's my idea, well, you're going to get less of them because you're cutting off... You're, you're saying it's not coming from out here, so you're putting up a block to it coming from out there. Mm. So it sounds like you approach life similarly to the way you approach the kitchen, you know, just like um, like art. And I'm not saying that you shut your brain down for life, but it does sound like something beyond your brain is guiding you in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel, I don't know, the metaphor I use is like the brain is like the research team. It comes up with the... The, the documents, you know, here's our mm-hmm. here's your report with what the, the, the options are and the details about them and then your intuition your heart is what's actually making the decisions at all times mm. and it, it, to, to live in the most flowing way obviously, a lot of people don't do it that way and I did for a long time and I was fucking miserable, I was doing all the things that were logically correct to maximizing income, minimizing costs, doing, you know doing the things that the brain was like, oh, these are good, and, you know, since it doesn't feel good, just get shit-faced afterwards, you know, but, yeah, I, the, the brain serves a purpose, but it's, it's not to run your life, <laughs> it's not, it's not to decide what's best for you in the long run, uh, that's what the heart's for, yeah, the brain is a computer that you have to program with your, you know, I mean, it's hard, it's so hard to say, really, because of the physical and the non-physical aspects of it, like consciousness, brain, mind, like, I think the consciousness is the thing, back here listening to it all and seeing, like, seeing the thoughts go by, and the mind is the manifestation, like, the brain is the computer and the mind is, like, the operating system of the computer, and 
the consciousness has to program the brain, which then creates what the mind does. Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely, the brain is a computer, mm. and the way that you program it decides how it functions. Mm -hmm. and whether it's functioning in a way that benefits you or limits you, empowers you or disempowers you. And if you're holding thought patterns that other people put there, chances are they're not empowering you. Mm -hmm. yeah, not always. Some people are being programmed by someone who's programming them with good things, but public schools aren't. Mm -hmm. Media isn't. Right, Most for sure. parents aren't. For sure. Religions aren't. I mean, besides a very small number, like, yeah. so that's like, Marshall Silver puts it really. He was actually, I, th I think that was actually the first piece in there before I, before the law of attraction, before Abraham Hicks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was before the march and when I started looking at that stuff, like thinking about like solutions oriented, but definitely before oh. discovering Abraham Hicks. Mm -hmm. Um, I watched. I was watching Buzzsaw. This is. Uh, it's no longer active. But it was this YouTube interview show with Sean Stone, Oliver Stone's son. Okay. He was the host, okay. and he would have. He had you know Peter Joseph on. He had Adam Kokesh. He had uh, Abby mm -hmm. Martin. Tons of people. Lots of researchers into aliens. Researchers into the occult. Like all this different stuff. And he had this guy on named Marshall Silver, who's like one of the most famous hypnotists in the world. And during their conversation, you know, it starts off pretty quickly. Sean's like, so do you believe it's true that, like, 90% of people can be hypnotized? And there's very few that can't, and this and that. And Marshall's like, everyone can be hypnotized. Everyone is hypnotized all the time. Let me break it down for you. As, you know, he doesn't say this, but it's like, as the world's most famous hypnotist, hypnosis is hearing, seeing, thinking something, mm -hmm. believing it to be true, and acting as though it were true. And everyone is doing that at all times. The only question is, who's, do, who's doing the hypnosis? Are they things that you have chosen to believe? Or are they things that other people said and you believed? Because they were an authority figure. Or mm -hmm. because of whatever. Yeah. You know, and that was, you know, kind of a more rational, logical way of introducing it. And once I, like, really... Because that just clicked right away. I was like, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And then that opened the door for the law of attraction stuff. But it's like, yeah, you're, we're all... We hear these things, we say them, we, we run programs, and then that... We, ba we, we act based on those programs. You know, if you run a program that says that you should be scared of dark places by yourself, you're going to act accordingly you're going right. to avoid them right. when you are in them you're going to be very fearful which is what draws you to being a victim like right. you know yeah, like it is. It's predators like, smell totally. prey mm -hmm. if you're not prey they don't bother you mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I could walk through the middle of like the shittiest part of any city with a gold watch on and nobody would mess with me because I don't have the they would know just by looking at me. Yes, yes. There would be no energy of fear. There would be no energy of worry. So yes, they would know yes. that for some reason, I'm not prey. Or I would just mm -hmm. be, like, completely invisible to them because mm -hmm. it's just not on their wavelength. Mm -hmm. And that it's everywhere. It, yeah. You know, every facet is, like, how you, how you program your brain beforehand is going to affect those the split-second decisions, the, the off-the-cuff, the... Cuff, the the reactions you know it's hard to control your reactions in the moment because right. they're automatic basically because right. they're a program I can, you know input output yes but you can rewrite the program at any point it you just are takes proof time. you are proof kenny <laughs> so i feel like as far as what we can do to change the world truly not in like a short-term way not in a you know, there, there's a lot of ways to change. Everything changes. Every single thing you do changes the world. One of my other favorite things to say. <laughs> it's the easiest way to really get people to listen to the concepts of manifesting or whatever, like anything. is like every thing you go into, you know, smiling at somebody versus not. Saying hello to somebody versus not. You know, like leaving a tip, not. Every single thing you do changes the world. And there's no way to anticipate the ripples from any given action or lack of action. Um, 
but I, as far as like long term moving to the vision that I hold and it seems like a lot of the people who come to events like this hold similar ones healing yourself number one because you can't do anything else until you do that you can't and, and, and doing that tends to lead to all of these other amazing things like this whole journey has been about healing myself it's it's I, I it's about learning to communicate it's about learning to value myself it's about learning to to live in community it's about like all of these every step of it is is healing me as it's adding to or helping heal or whatever for the others that I'm interacting with but healing yourself and then helping the next generation to have less trauma that they have to heal 